Joined by Alice Madden, who was the majority leader in the Colorado House and has worked on climate and environmental issues for years and years. And now your latest challenge is joining the Democratic primary against Republican Senator Cory Gardner. Crowded field, to say the least, yes. coming up on about a dozen people. What did you think was missing in the field that prompted you to get in? Well, people run for very personal reasons. And I care a lot about climate change and the environment, and I've been working to help the next generation thrive, basically my whole career. And I know what it takes to get things done in DC, and I felt like I have the breadth of experience and <laughs> basically the, the, the experience that it takes right now in Washington to get something done. It is a chew you up and spit you out kind of place. Um, it's not the time to learn on the job, and we need action now. When I read what you've written and when I listen to what you have to say and when I read what your, your opponents in the Democratic primary have to say about climate change, I don't get a tremendous amount of disagreement. Is that fair to say? I hope so. <laughs> I hope that's fair to say. I think the difference is, is this is what I've dedicated my life to. I've worked on developing a clean energy economy, not only in Colorado, but across the country when I worked for President Obama. I ran a, a bill with Republican Speaker Lola Spradley in 2004 to create a renewable portfolio standard. So, you know, when people talk about a Green New Deal, it's not new to me. I've been doing this for a long, long time. On the issue of the Green New Deal, Democrats in Washington seem split on this non-binding resolution climate goals. Is that the right approach? You know, I'm a lawyer, so um, and have been a lawmaker, obviously, as well. So um, I think it's a fabulous blueprint, and it's gotten the conversation going, which I think is incredibly important. So now it's time to turn to what those actual laws could look like, so we can start again building this uh, clean energy economy that is an incredibly inclusive way to go. There's jobs for all sectors of society, and it has the added benefit of helping the environment, our air, and our water. You'll hear, though, especially some more experienced Democrats in Washington say it's great to have pie-in-the-sky goals and things that are never going to pass and don't have the force of law if they do pass, but we need to actually do things, and that should be our approach as opposed to the Green New Deal. Well, I have a list of laws that we can pass um, in the first six months that I think actually have a bipartisan appeal. Uh, President Obama, uh, w working this administration, he had some incredibly uh, smart and rational rules around emissions capture, for example. Uh, Trump has gotten rid of all of those. Um, those can be reinstated, they could be codified, turned into law. So we require our oil and gas companies to actually measure their emissions. Um, and that's actually product that they're letting off into the air. So I think there's a real business case for them doing that, and it also helps the environment at the same time. Do you think that that's where Colorado is today, that they want their United States Senator to put climate first and foremost in terms of priorities in Washington? Well, I care about many things, and um, it's easy to be pegged to one issue candidate. I want to make sure that that is not the case. I mean, I've been working on health care, education, economic opportunity uh, my entire career. Um, this is probably one of the biggest emergencies we face right now. Uh, I can multitask, though, so I care about many things. So... You were in a statewide race for CU Region in 2016, a race that you lost, and some of the other Democratic candidates in this race have also lost statewide, Andrew Romanoff, Mike Johnson among them. Why should Democratic primary voters go with somebody who has run statewide and lost as opposed to somebody who's won statewide or at least hasn't been through that? Well, um, Barack Obama ran and lost as well, so um, it happens to the best of folks. Um, I would point out that 1.2 million people have already voted for me in this state, um, and that's way more than Cory Gardner got the last time he ran. Um, and that was before we knew that he had pulled the wool over on the eyes of the voters and before the Denver Post came out and unendorsed him. So I've had a lot of support in the past. And probably more importantly is I, I know how to win elections. I know how to raise money. I've done it before. I helped lead the um, progressive takeover in 2004, 06, 08. Um, I've run big campaigns before. And most importantly, I, I enjoy and learn from listening to the people in Colorado. We're four minutes into this conversation, and that's the first time that I think you've said Senator Cory Gardner's name, where most of the other Democrats in this race come in here chomping at the bit to talk about him uh, as, as opposed to what they're interested in. What do you think is the fundamental case against Cory Gardner today? You know, first and foremost, and the obvious one is that he's endorsed Donald Trump. But he has not been listening to the people in Colorado. I mean, he has voted against things in D.C. that we've done here and been successful. Remember, gun control, you name it, he's voted no. Um, and I, I don't like to come out and say I'm vote, you know, running against something. I want to I run for something. I'm, I'm running for the people of Colorado. But, you know, I know Corey. I've known him for a long time. Um, 
you know, he has let us down in so many ways. And Colorado deserves better. Why do you think that is? Why, do, why has he let us down? Yeah. Or, well, on any number of issues, health care. I mean, why do a completely, you know, window dressing vote of going against Obamacare? You know, people want health care. We have people across this uh, state outside the metro area who are paying way more than they should be for their health care benefits. He, and that is a real concern every single day. And he's not addressing that. We have people who are afraid to send their kids to school. He's not been anywhere on gun safety. I have a son who teaches um, in public schools. He used to be a wild firefighter. Never in a million years did I think I would be more afraid for him now than he was when he was fighting raging fires. So I asked you the why of, around Senator Gardner, and you'll hear a lot of Democrats say that. So if you accept the premise that he has changed somehow, and a lot of other Democrats say, no, he's always been the same guy all along, but you've known him for years. Do you think that he has changed? And if he has, why do you think that is? You know, I think once you get to Washington, for a lot of people, um, it's all about, it's about being reelected and where your money comes from. And we see where Corey's money is coming from. And sadly, I think he's been led down the path to listening more to special interest donors than the actual people of Colorado. I asked Mike Johnson this when he was first in the door to come talk to me about this race. Is there anybody who could get into this race that would cause you to get out of the Democratic primary? Former Governor Hickenlooper, Congressman Perlmutter, anybody? I don't know. Um, I hope, I, I mean, I hope not. I'm doing this because uh, I think I can lead on the issues that Coloradans care about. Um, of course, you know, I'm also rational and I will watch and proceed, but I know I can raise the funds needed to, to stay in this race. I know that I can earn the support of the people of Colorado, particularly our primary voters. And I, I will obviously wait and see. But, you know, we've never elected a woman to this seat either. So I, I, there's a lot of women behind me, a lot of environmentalists, a lot of people who care about education, tuition, debt, that really want me to stay in this race. And so I have no plans of leaving it. Colorado has no problem sending women to the state house. I know. To lead but yet has never elected a female governor or senator. What's the disconnect? I don't know. We have an amazing bench, um, and I'm about electing women. When I was majority leader in the State House, I loved having all these women that I worked with and was able to make chairs of committees, and they did amazing jobs. And when you elect women, you, you end up talking about things that really matter to the middle class. But, you know, it's, it's 2019, and we're still fighting on choice. We're still fighting about paid leave, equal pay, health care. Those are all things that women lead on. So I think the more women representatives, the better. Finally, uh, haven't talked a lot about the president in this conversation either, uh, which is a bit of a, a differentiation from some of the other conversations I've had with, with Democrats in this primary. I'm curious, there seems to be a growing thought in Washington among Democrats that starting impeachment proceedings is not a wise move and that it's playing into the president's hands and that the referendum is in 2020. Suppose that referendum includes President Trump being reelected and Senator Alice Men coming to Washington. Is that the time for impeachment? I think if the, if we take, if the Democrats take control of the Senate, um, yes, I would. I mean, but, but to back up, I mean, I, right now the House is doing a lot of congressional investigations that I hope lead the American people to the inevitable conclusion that Donald Trump should be impeached. Do you think anybody's really going to change their mind about Donald Trump at this point? Um, I don't think the Senate right now votes to impeach him. That's, that's the big problem. But what about Americans? You're talking about House investigations changing Americans' minds. Do yes. you see minds changing? I, I do as, I mean, especially around impeachment. Should he be impeached? And, you know, th that's also, I know, a political question. And people are, you know, strat st strategy-wise trying to think what we should do. But the American people need to learn what's in the Mueller report. And they need to learn what happened with our elections. And if we have foreign governments interfering, there's nothing more basic that's, you know, a, it's just an attack on our democracy. And I think they deserve to know that. Do you imagine that there will be interference in 2020? I certainly hope not. I think every secretary of state across the country has to make sure that they are totally honed in on this. Um, it's, I think it'll be up to the states to protect us. The states are the bulwark against the actual voting process, and then the interference umbrella could be kind of larger, you know, in terms of the way that- Yes, I mean, obviously the, the, the social media interference, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully, Facebook, Twitter, they're, they're trying to get on board, but you know, that goes, we hear different things every single day about how effective they are or aren't being. Thank you for coming in. Welcome to the race. There are many of you, uh, but we'll get a school bus together and we'll drive around <laughs> and we'll talk about issues or something like that. I'd enjoy that. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.
Subscribe to the next YouTube channel and I'll buy you a beer. Am I actually buying them a beer? This could be a very poor idea. We need some terms and conditions. Offer subject to terms and conditions.